Nourish My Soul is so incredibly proud to bring to you this week's episode of Radical Thursdays, where our From the Ground Up alumni, Bella and Kenya, are talking to Ashley, the founder of Brown Girl Diaries, based in Toronto, um, and they center around Indo-Caribbean women, and it's a fantastic organization, but what's even more fantastic is the conversation that happens between Bella, Kenya, and Ashley as they talk about identity um, and what it means and how important it is to be connected to our culture. So I hope you enjoy this episode and um, give us your feedback. Tell us what you think. Welcome back to Radical Thursdays. During this episode, we interviewed Ashley from the Brown Girl Diary, an organization based in Toronto that empowers Indo-Caribbean women. We had an an incredible discussion about the Indo-Caribbean culture, stigmas they face from within, and how to strengthen your cultural identity. Hope you enjoy. Welcome, and can you tell us a little about yourself? Yeah, of course. So um, my name is Ashley. I'm the founder of the Brown Girl Diary. I also um, work in a nonprofit organization running the communications aspect of uh, what they do. Um, And I studied political science when I was in school. And mainly I studied that actually because I wanted to go into law. Um, But at the time, it just wasn't me. Like I didn't see myself as a lawyer anymore as I started to get to know myself. And I was kind of like, okay, this is what route do I want to take? And I knew that all throughout my life, like since I was 11 years old, I was always involved in different nonprofits or involved in a lot of community work. So I knew that I had a lot of inspiration and a lot of insight um, about who I was from these experiences. And I knew that I wanted to make a difference. Um, For me, whenever I did something, of course, money is important. But for me, it wasn't the only thing that was important to me. I knew that I wanted to make a change in people's lives. So once I finished school, or when I was finishing school, actually, because of my last year, what was supposed to be my last year, um, there was a strike and I was also pregnant. So I was trying to finish up. There was a strike. I couldn't get all my courses done. I had to drop a few courses. So when I had went back for my last year, I'm like, it, it was a time where I was like, what do I want to do with myself? Like, who do I want to be? Right. Especially being a new mother. I feel like a lot of new mothers sort of go through this phase where they've kind of just like had an awakening and they're kind of like, okay, now I'm not just living for myself, I'm living for somebody else too. So what does that mean? And what is the mark that I want to leave on the world as cliche as that sounds? Um, but yeah, like, I feel like it was my last year of university. And that's when I realized I wanted to go into the nonprofit work. And I decided to start my own nonprofit organization. I wrote my first grant um, with Art Reach Toronto. So a lot of people probably know about Art Reach Toronto, but I also um, started working with my job as a volunteer. So I started writing a lot of their blogs. I started running their social media very casually, Um, but it did give me a lot of experience, which was super, super important to getting my position once I finished school. Without that one year of experience that I had gotten um, as a volunteer, I would have never gotten my position within communication. So that was a big, big key thing for me um, was volunteering and taking advantage of the the free opportunities that weren't paying me. Um, because they made probably the biggest impacts in my life. So that's a little bit about me. Um, And yeah, and right now I'm just working through this pandemic, um, running Brown Girl Diary and helping everything that I'm doing, all these platforms that I work with just grow and flourish. Yeah, starting off with uh, nonprofits that you're not like running yourself first is always a way to throw you into the deep end real quick. It is so true. Once they know you have one skill, they're like, what else can you do? What else can you do? And you just, it, it's good because you get to learn a lot of things. It can be overwhelming sometimes, but I think it's definitely worth it. It's a great place to start, especially if you want any type of experience. Definitely. Um, so you talked a little bit about what kind of got you into your post kind of grad, still grad um, experience in nonprofit and then uh, uh, ultimately a BGD. Um, what really uh, inspired you to start the Brown Girl Diary? Yes, I love that question. (laughs) Um, What inspired me to start Brown Girl Diary? Well, like I said, I was at a point um, in my life where I was just kind of like, what am I doing and who do I want to be? And like I said, a lot of times when we look at nonprofits, I remember somebody years ago telling me like, how are you going to start a nonprofit? Like, you don't really have a story, right? Like, what is your story that you're going to tell? 
And for years I sat on that. I'm like, oh my God, I don't have an impactful story where this tragic experience impacted me. But then when I started to reflect, I was having a conversation with one of my mentors and I was like, you know, I just really want to create a space. I don't know what I want the space to be about. I just knew I wanted to create a space. And my mentor, she is, um, she's the founder, a co-founder of an organization that's called Lost Lyrics. They don't really do, they don't really do a lot of work anymore. But as I was growing up for about 10 years, from 11 to 21, you could say, they did a lot of ad advocacy work and they were running um, programs for youth in Malvern and Jane and Finch. And then we would collaborate like downtown Toronto, where we'd be focusing on like the roots of hip hop, um, hood politics, um, the injustices within our community. So it was really cool. That's really where I found who I was. Um, so that was the mentor that I was talking to. And she's just like, you know, why don't you create a space for brown women? And I'm like, yeah, that's true. There's not a lot of spaces for brown women. And as I started to put stories together, I realized there were so many, brown could be defined in so many different ways. So I was like, what is something that's specific to me, right? Like, what is something that I can niche in? And a lot of people always talk about this, like, what is your niche? What is your focus, right? So I started to dig a little more, focus on my own story. And then I came across the term Indo-Caribbean and I was like, okay, I like this. Like, I feel connected to this term. I feel like this defines who I am. Um, I felt like there was a lot of like meaningful connection to it when I heard it. I'm Indian, I'm Caribbean because we go through our lives all the time as as Caribbean people. And we're like, OK, what am I? Especially like in Indian people in the Caribbean specifically, it's kind of just like, OK, you're Indian, but you're Caribbean. Like you listen to we watch Bollywood, but you listen to Soka and you listen to dance hall and you do all these different things. So it's kind of like what defines you. Right. So. I was still struggling to figure that out. So what I wanted to do was create a space where we weren't looking for a definition anymore, but we were creating a definition, right? So that's where Brown Girl Diaries sort of like evolved from. And then once we started doing programming um, and we got our grants, so we got the grant through Outreach and then we started doing programming. And once programming was done, the money was done. So I was like, okay, what do I do now? And obviously we're living in a time where everything's online, everything is social media. So I'm like, okay, let me see what I could do here. So for the first, like, so I finished programming in September and then from September to like February, I was just like at a plateau. I was trying to put out content. I was trying to do this. I was trying to do that. I was trying to wear all the hats in the organization, which was probably the, one of the hardest things. You, one thing I would stress is you cannot do this alone. So I was like, okay, cool. What am I gonna do now? So a pandemic came. Well, it was just about the pandemic. I had actually went to New York to film a, po a podcast with um, like a partnering organization. Um, and then when I came back, it was the pandemic. So we were working from home. It was literally like right before a pandemic, I was in New York, which was pretty interesting. But anyway, um, so it was like right, like right when the pandemic started, I was stuck at home. I was working from home. But obviously, as we're adjusting, I had a lot of additional time. So I'm like, okay, what am I going to do with Brown Girl Diary now? So that's when I decided to put together a team. And now we're a team of six women. So we have an editor in chief. We have someone who runs our social media. We have someone who runs our outreach. We have someone who runs our like business pages, like LinkedIn. And then we also, and I know we're going to get into that a little bit, but um, we also have like a networking platform. But like we said, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But that's basically what inspired me to start Brown Girls Are and what it grew to be. That's great. I mean, you talked about a lot of points there that um, we are going to talk about later on and as we go through um, that whole identity thing um, when you're mixed in general or I don't know about you. Let me put my phone on vibrate. <laughs> um, yeah, or you live in a primarily uh, white community. Um, you do go through a big um it depends on who you are, of course. Um, I was talking with Kenya a little bit about this beforehand, uh, and she didn't feel it as much until I started talking, but this kind of who am I and where do I belong and what term fits me and yeah, where can I find my niche? I think it's really cool that you found that uh, problem within your community and was able to act on it. Um, but yeah, uh, you talked a little about the pandemic and how you were hitting a wall there. I think a lot of people in the activism and nonprofit community hit a major wall with this pandemic of not having enough resources to kind of help, but at the same time, not being able to do anything because we're stuck inside basically. So 
that, that was really um, relatable, at least in the uh, activism and nonprofit world that you talk to. Um, so Ken, now we're into the uh, Brown Girl Diary section of this podcast. Can you speak a little bit about that? Um, I know you talked about it, but um, projects that you're doing currently, uh, you've mentioned your blog um, and podcasts that you've been on, including this one. Um, and you mentioned programs in the first year. Or so what kind of programs did you do in transition? And I noticed that this is a lot <laughs> I'm throwing at you, but- no. uh, you had a Facebook group, which I thought was really cool for Indo-Caribbean women to network and kind of uh, empower each other. So yeah, we have a few different projects running right now. We have our blog, which is basically um, women in the community who are telling their stories all the time. Like every couple of months, we usually like refresh our blogging team because there's some women who kind of like step back or there's women who are no longer interested in writing. Um, but we usually try to keep it pretty fresh where we have stories coming in all the time, which is one of the coolest things because one thing that we really, really focus on is that we cannot tell the stories of our community, right? We have to get our community to do it. We're not going to know we're not going to be able to represent every single intersectional identity. So how are we going to reach out to these women and get them to tell their stories? Because I wouldn't say it's necessarily the first of its kind, um, but there's not a lot of platforms for Indo-Caribbean women. So we want to make sure that we are creating a space that's very, very open. If somebody has a story that they want to tell, how can we support them in telling that story? If they have a, if they have a business that they want to promote, how can we do that? And I think that gets into the social media aspect. So from March, when I brought on my team to now, we've grown our social media platform by over 600%. And it's like a random number, but we started off with 900 followers. And that's when I really was able to understand teamwork and realize that you can't do it alone because collectively us holding our own weight and us, you know, doing what we do best, we were able to get our followers to just over 6,000 followers now, which was super, super amazing. Um, in the first month, we reached like, I think over 2000 followers. Um, we had someone from breakfast television reach out to us and um, get connected with us and want to do run a project with us. So that was super exciting. We were featured on breakfast television. That was probably like literally one of the best days of my life. So I love that. Um, but yeah, like we try to run like different panels. We have panels about different topics that are interesting, uh, interesting to us. We, um, and we recently launched a mentorship group. So this is basically like a project, a pilot project. So what we're trying to do is see what women are interested in, what women are engaging in and what they enjoy, what they like to talk about in terms of professionalism and Indo-Caribbean women in professional fields and in fields of business and in fields of education um, and how they want to interact again, on that professional lens. So what we do in that group is we have different socials, we have women um, give women the opportunity to promote themselves, we give women the opportunity to just like share tools and resources, but it's much, much more inclusive than our Instagram or our general Facebook group. It's a, a collection of specific women who are interested in focusing on specific things. So it's very, very, again, niche. I think that's one of the most important things that we could do. Um, so what we're trying to do is launch a membership program in early um, summer. So basically what our Facebook group is, it's just a space, um, an inclusive space for Indo-Caribbean women that um, have the option to join. It's a private Facebook group. And basically what it is, it's a pilot project for our membership program that we want to launch in June. So a little background about what our membership program is going to look like in June is it's basically going to be this cool portal where you can log in, you have a dashboard, um, you have access to all these different workshops, you have access to all these different um, tools and resources from women within the community. And it's all by Indo-Caribbean women for Indo-Caribbean women. It's gonna have a space where they can network, it's gonna have a space where they can connect, a space where they can share opportunities. And what it is, it's really just to create representation and put us on the map. Like, like we said, there's not a lot of Indo-Caribbean women um, in our communities that we know there's not a lot of Indo-Caribbean women that we can connect with. So ensuring that we can create this space is one of the key elements that we wanna do. So with that, um, we also wanna branch, we're also working on um, developing a directory of Caribbean businesses where people can go on. Um, and we have a, a huge, huge, huge network where there's women in Florida, there's women in New York, there's women in Arizona, there's women in the UK, there's women in Australia. So there's literally women all over the world that are Indo-Caribbean that we need to find a way to get connected to them. So ensuring that we can create this directory gives people the accessibility to where they can 
be connected with, support the businesses, support the Indo-Caribbean businesses, support the Caribbean businesses and whatever it is that they want to so they can um, help us grow and again, put us on the map and create that representation. So those are some of the projects that we're specifically working on right now. And of course, like I said, our panels, our, um, our panels, our social media and all that good stuff. First of all, I would like to just say congratulations on, what was it like your 600% growth on yeah, um exciting we like we were like at the beginning we were like literally watching it the whole time like as it was growing and growing and growing because we just had like one post um about um cultural appropriation that just like blew up and it had like over 1200 shares it was really cool so that was exciting that's incredible i think it speaks volumes to not only teamwork but the need for a platform within your community um you also mentioned um kind of uh blog posts, um, stuff like that, and people that uh, maybe want to do it once or twice or uh, continuously. Um, do you have, this is kind of like specific and it's totally fine, you know, I'm just curious, uh, like an anonymous, because, <laughs> uh, okay, let me explain myself while I'm asking this first. Um, in universities, I don't know if your university had it when you went to school, but they'll have like <laughs> pages that are like, anonymous confessions <laughs> um, where people will send things in <laughs> this is so bad and no that's I it's important, know, important do right? you have like an anonymous uh place where people can submit like blog articles i guess if they don't feel comfortable quite or don't like feel revealing who they are yeah no I think that a lot of times what women do is they'll reach out to us and say that they want to share their story but they want it to be anonymous when it's out so usually women come to us and they'll, they usually like don't hide their own identity when they connect we've never had that experience but you know what I think that raises a really really good point that we might have never thought about like how do we create an anonymous portal where women can submit through there and they don't have to share their identity but they can still share their story right because there might be a lot of women who are kind of stopping themselves from sharing stories because of that reason, right? Because they do have to share their identity in the first place and they're not sure who's on the team or who's on the back end or who knows who, especially in an Indo-Caribbean community, everybody knows everyone. So I think that is probably one of the things that we need to consider actually. So thank you for bringing that up. But um, we have had a few women come to us and be like, yeah, we do wanna share our story, but we just don't wanna share our identity. Um, so how can we do that? And we usually help guide them through it. We haven't had too many instances, but I think within our community, when we do talk about very, very sensitive topics like intergenerational trauma, um, substance abuse, um, um, what else is there? There's like violence against women. That's a major thing in our community. So I think when we start to dive deeper into those things, which we haven't done so as much yet, I think we'll get a lot more. Yeah. I just asked because at least in women in our community as women a lot of times people it's a lot of things are very taboo topics that people just don't feel comfortable telling their names so yeah of course like I said why uh the reason why I asked that was because it just dawned on me there's confession pages god that's so embarrassing to admit that I, um, no. follow those. <laughs> sometimes you just need that space where you could just like put something out there without people having to know who you are sometimes yeah, you I don't even like post to it but the things that people do post uh under the cloak of uh, being anonymous you're able to uh learn about warnings and stuff like that about other people that may take advantage but anyway the other one was uh you talked about in your facebook group you'll kind of leave these discussions of what they want to kind of talk about and what have you so do you do like daily or like weekly, I don't know, like polls to lead the discussion to see where people are at that way? Or is it more discussion based where someone will post and then all the comments? Yeah, I think it's a little mix of both. Like one thing that we try to do, um, and again, we only started it in about December. So we haven't had too many socials. We've only had one social so far, um, but it was great. It lasted like three hours and it was amazing. But um, I think, um, in terms of like how we run the page is if we notice it starts to die out and people are not really talking, people are not really sharing. We haven't had too many instances, which I were very lucky with that because um, women are always sharing stuff. Um, it's more just a space where 
we do ask questions if we need to, but usually like they guide the, they guided themselves, to be honest. The women in the group are so assertive. They're so on point. They're so ready to have these conversations. I think because it's kind of like a burning piece of them that's never been able to get out. So now that they do have this accessible space where they literally just have to go onto their Facebook and be like, okay, guys, what do you think about this? Okay, I read this article about Indo-Caribbeanism and, and you find women researching more and you find women doing all these different things on their own accord. So I think that with them doing that, they're striking conversations all the time. Like We haven't really had a few days go by where nobody's posted or nobody's just checked in and been like, hey, this is what I'm working on. Or, hey, I run this business. Or, hey, blah, blah, blah. Like We leave it as an open space so people are able to post whatever they want i mean within reason right like we haven't had any cases where someone posts something they shouldn't um and hopefully we don't have that <laughs> but um yeah like, but yeah that's pretty much like how it goes so we've been really lucky to have like a, a a very 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 um interactive group of women so that's super exciting that's so awesome that your participation level is so high within that group uh you also talked about a uh directory like network which I thought was so cool and interesting because you don't see that like a centralized location where you can like find these communities uh wherever you may be I, I just I don't know it's especially in such a niche community like most places uh communities happen to be I think it's very cool and innovative of you guys to do that yeah, and I think um, a big chunk of it, the reason that that came to be is because we have so many women that will DM us and be like, hey, do you know of any like um, social workers in our community? Do you know anybody who owns this type of business in our community? Do you know anybody who does this? So we're like, what we really wanted to do was create, um, like, like I said, an online directory. Um, but what's in the works right now is figuring out if we want to keep it as Indo-Caribbean or how are we going to section it off, right? Like Indo-Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean owned businesses, general Caribbean owned businesses. We're still trying to figure that out and what that space needs to look like. So um, it's definitely in the works. It's definitely a conversation we're having, but right now we're just, we recently put up a post um, in December asking people to drop like Indo-Caribbean owned businesses. And that's why we opened it up to so many different parts of the world because we're like, there's Indo-Caribbean people everywhere. So let's just have that one space, right? So, um, so yeah, that's what we're working on and we're putting together. It's a very tedious process because you got to like look for the business, look for the city, look for um, whatever, whatever, like what type of, um, like, what can you say? What category they fall under? So figuring out all the different categories, figuring out this, figuring out that, like um, foods and like, you know, goods and services, this, that. So it's a lot, a lot of different things that we're working on, but we're definitely, it's not something that we're rushing. We want to make sure that it's done properly and we want to make sure it's done efficiently so people can actually use it. Um, That serves, Bella, real quick, Bella, I saw you look at the snow. Yeah, it's like snowing, snowing. Um, yeah, it's coming down a bit heavier. You live in Toronto, so you get, I'm sure, way more snow than we do here in Connecticut. Are you there? Connecticut. There? Yeah, we Shut get up. snow a lot during the winter, but Shut up. you guys are in Connecticut. Surprises me. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know you're in Toronto. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I I that's my love name. Toronto. That's oh my, my goodness, Toronto. So I'm like looking out because I know it was snowing before, but now it's like died down. So I'm like, okay, is it snowing? Okay. Again? But oh, okay, okay, cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it snows like in general, but this year we have been having more flurry snows, and then it'll get like weirdly hot probably because of climate change or something so how did you find us how did you find us we instagram. explore a lot on instagram because we're always looking for different niches and it's hard to find it and so we'll follow a lot of activism hashtags um we just go around instagram or like you know how like the suggested from some people will go down like little oh, okay. that way oh okay. cool, cool nice yeah <laughs> we do a lot of little digging on our own or sometimes no. tiktok we stay instagram stalking so don't even worry about it <laughs> so um you mentioned your facebook group which is incredible so um can you also i mean we probably should have done this probably earlier but can you just um ex or expand on who is considered an indo-caribbean person 
Yeah, of course. Um, well, exactly what it sounds like. But I know, like, in... I am mean, not, like, okay, start that over. That came out so bad. Like, exactly. You're good. You're good. Yeah, it's literally, it's literally a mix of, of the two words, right? Indian and Caribbean. And I know, like, you, as you guys said, you're located in Connecticut. And one thing that we did when I went to New York, actually, to do that podcast, and I was having a conversation with the, the women who were running it, which were in the Caribbean, one of them had lived in Texas at a point in her life. But she's like... In Texas, she nobody knew what Indian or Caribbean was. Like they knew what it was, but they didn't really have an, a true, true understanding of the culture or what what it meant. So generally, like she was just considered like an an African American woman. She was just considered that's how she identified when she was in Texas. But it wasn't until she came back to New York where she really started to explore that piece of her. So I know in New York, it's very, it's it's much like Toronto. Like it's very like it's like Toronto is very very diverse in terms of like people coming from different parts of the world and this like cultural like melting pot of different identities so i think that when we look at indo-caribbean it's literally um caribbean people of indian descent or the um indian diaspora they came from india um through the indentureship into the caribbean and usually like they disperse obviously to other places in north america like like i had mentioned before new york um new york toronto um, Florida, what, I would say those are the three main places. There's a lot of um, Indo-Caribbeans in the UK too. Um, but yeah, I would say that's how you would identify as Indo-Caribbean if you're a Caribbean with Indian roots. Can you just say uh, really quickly and explain what indentureship is? Because I, before this, I saw it on your website. And so I didn't know that term specifically. So I looked it up and learned a little about it. But just for the general, I don't know if everyone knows <laughs> But that is so um yeah so basically what the indentureship is is it started in the late 1800s and what it was is a lot of south asians were given a lot of false promises um by these europeans to come over to the caribbean and to um work and to work and to live a better life than what they were living in spaces like india or sri lanka or pakistan or all these different places um but when they came over here it wasn't what it appeared to be a lot of times there was a lot of abuse there was a lot of violence there was a lot of um crime so a lot of people when they got to the caribbean they either didn't have anybody any family to go back to um they were feel fearful of their lives they didn't want to get back on the boat because they didn't know what would happen to them because so many people were dying on the trip from the Caribbean to the um from sorry from South Asia to the Caribbean but basically the term indentured is basically just um low-wage workers so they were paid very very low wage wages to work in these communities um so they were working on like sugarcane fields they were house sitters they were all these different things but um that's basically how Indians got to the Caribbean so they weren't there for very long because the last ship to come to the Caribbean um, under the indentureship was 1920, I believe. So yeah. that was only literally like 100 years ago. So Indo-Caribbean culture only started about 100 years ago. So when we think about um, African history or we think about European history, what started like, you know, centuries and centuries ago, there's been a buildup of content and a buildup of resources over time. Whereas we don't have those resources. We're developing them now. That's why there's so like little, like there's very few books, there's very few spaces, there's very few conversations about it because the indentureship only ended a hundred years ago. Yeah, and that also, uh, for anybody just learning about this and is uh, looking as to like, why is this relevant? Uh, like she said, it, it was only about a hundred years ago. Um, I think just over, <laughs> like just a, a year over a hundred years ago at this point in time when it like officially ended. Yeah. Quote unquote things that's like a rough date though, as we all know, things yeah, tend course. to be ended, but don't actually end in for a couple of years. Um, so it is still very relevant and it still can impact people in the community uh heavily, like with everything else. Um you see it, you talked about a little bit about uh generational trauma earlier. Um, you can see it, the change in uh this is a bit of a different kind of generational trauma. I don't know what specifically you're talking or referring about, but uh, it can cause generational trauma and be shown in people's DNA from what uh, their ancestors had endured. So course, things course. are still very relevant. Yeah. Especially, especially alcoholism. Mm -hmm. and I think that was a big, big thing within our community. It still is. We still see a lot of people in our community with um, suffering with those issues and it doesn't go talked about. Like it doesn't, 
it isn't talked about at all, right? So I think that was one of the big things that we focus on too is having those conversations that are hard for people to have, especially because it's always swept under the rug within our community. So so when we were, when Belle and I were just kind of like researching, um, we thought that we should also, it's very valuable to mention the different stigmas that are related to your culture and that Indo-Caribbean space. And I love how you mentioned alcoholism because that very well could be a very large stigma. Um, so can you mention some other stigmas that your culture might face in this kind of whitewashed world that we live in? Yeah, the stigmas that we face in this whitewashed world that we live in. I think in our communities, like specifically Toronto and specifically Toronto, because I grew up as an Indo-Caribbean in Toronto. So I can only speak from that experience. I can't speak for anybody else's experience and what stigmas they may face in different communities. Because like I said, there's probably a lot of Indo-Caribbeans in Connecticut, but they live a different life than we do, right? Especially because in the community that I live in, it's so many Indo-Caribbean people. It's so many Caribbean people, right? Almost everybody in the community is Caribbean or from the Caribbean or from um, descend, like they are from descending countries of where we're from, right? So um, I would say that in regards to like the stigmas that we face in in the world that we currently live in is that Indo-Caribbean women are put on this line, like they're put on this line of, are you Indian or are you Caribbean? And I feel like a lot of our stigmas come from there of who we're expected to be um, related to like family and um, like in terms of like family and what that looks like, the family aspect of things, but also within the general community. So for example, um, in high school, and this is where I had like an identity crisis, I would say, and where I really started to realize like, I don't know if I fit in with this community um, because like we're expected to act a certain way. We're expected to listen to certain types of music at least that's what we think, right? There's a lot of women who feel the same way as me. And that was the cool thing about Brown Girl Diary. But I would say that sometimes we're expected to live a certain life through our indo caribbean culture. So not from outside. I feel like the stigmas come from inside, if that makes sense, within the community, not outside the community. I feel like people don't even know what indo caribbean is. So they don't have any stigmas related to us, but they know us as like coolie girls, right? So that's what they call our people sometimes, like coolie, right? Which also... Is, is, is considered a, a derogatory term. Um, so a lot of people don't use it, but at the same time, a lot of people use it very casually. People like to compare it to the N-word. It's again, not as severe as the N-word, but it is generally the same idea where certain, certain people use it, certain people don't. It's basically personal preference. But as I was saying, in terms of like the stigmas related to our community, a lot of it comes from internally and what we're expected to be and who we're expected to be and all these stigmas. And for me, I grew up in a very westernized family and my family, my parents grew up here. They didn't have a lot of culture attached. They did have a lot of culture attached to them, but not necessarily with the way that they raised us. It wasn't very traditional. So for me, I had all these friends that were raised very traditional and I was like, okay, I don't fit in. I don't fit these ideas that are supposed to, that are supposed to make me who I am as an Indo-Caribbean woman. Right. So I think that a lot, like I was saying, a lot of it comes in, comes from internally. But a lot of times when we look at it from the outside, looking in, when we look at other Caribbean people or South Asian people, they're kind of like, OK, what are you like? Do you like Indian music or you don't like Indian music or do you like soca and reggae and dance hall or you don't? Right. So like what, what part of what part of the country do you fit in? And I feel like, again, that's where a lot of the stigmas come from. So when you hop when you're with your Caribbean friends, your Afro-Caribbean friends, which I grew up with a lot of, they they didn't have an understanding of what why our identities were different or why our experiences were different or why our, um, yeah, just in general, like why our experiences and our opportunities or whatever the case may be were different, right? Because Indo-Caribbean is not a term that's talked about. When we think about like South Asian culture and we think about like, how is it connected to us? We're trying to figure out like, where do we fit on this line? So, and again, this is something that we're still breaking down. That's why I feel like it it's, can be very complicated because we're like, where do we fit on this line? And how do we interact with all these people versus all these stigmas that we have within our culture versus the way that people see us, right? Because I feel like Afro-Caribbean people in the general Caribbean community are not able to understand who we are, our experiences. And understand that they're different but the south asian community there's not a lot of acceptance there so we get a lot of pushback in that sense so i would say like i said again 
a lot of the stigmas come from internally as opposed to from externally, where it's just a misunderstanding or a lack of understanding or just like a complete blank of what it even means to be in no Caribbean. I yeah, love I, oh, oh, I love how you mentioned the complexities that the I guess the, the term stigma and how it applies is I, 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 that's something we don't really talk about often, I think, as minorities in general, you often highlight or you have to explain stigma is mm. as it relates to uh, or have, that the white community has put on uh, whatever minority uh, culture you're a part of. Um, but you don't often think about or have the discussions surrounding stigma perpetrated by your own community putting yeah. like, that goes around or within yourself that's just not a topic you talk about a lot and so I think it was interesting that you highlighted that I would have never I mean we don't talk about it I don't even know how to explain it other than that so but, but and yeah. then you talked about this line that this internal stigma uh makes and I don't know I am obviously not into Caribbean um but I think that line can be seen in a lot of uh, immigrant families or mixed families. Um, for example, for me, um, my mom's white, my dad's Colombian, came over from Colombia when they married. Um, and you've seen a lot of the Colombian culture, this uh, stigma that exists that I <laughs> didn't even have that flashlight on until you talked about your own uh, stigmas uh, of this line of, well, you're too white for the Colombians, but you're not uh, white enough for uh, the general white uh, community. Yeah. And that's then- That's exactly, I would say, that's spot on exactly what it is, right? Uh, if you're just, if you come from either uh, immigrant parents, both being immigrant, or you're mixed, you find this line of not, of feeling a connection to whatever culture it may be. So in my case, like I was saying, Colombian, but- also a pushback like you mentioned of not being Colombian enough for some people or and being too whitewashed or in my um, cousins are technically dad's cousin but you know nevertheless uh case she um her both her parents uh my uh dad's uh tia and tia are Colombian they immigrated here both fully Colombian uh, she's fully Colombian, but whenever she's in Colombia, uh, spending time with our family, um, she experiences a pushback because despite the fact that she's uh, fully Colombian genetically, uh, she's too American or too white, even though she's not. So I, I think it was really interesting that you highlighted on that. I keep saying that, but this fine line is the best way to put it of not quite have experiencing pushback on both sides and not being able to find out where you fully align quite yet as you grow. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think that's again, like a big part of it. I know there's like a lot of women who come to us and, and tell them how can we be a part? Like we kind of have to convince them to be a part of the community because for a long time, they felt a lot of pushback from their own community to the point where they're like, I don't even want to support Indo Caribbean culture. I don't want to be a part of it. I hate it. So there have been women who are just like, oh, I don't want to be a part of this. I don't want this. I don't want that. So it, sometimes it's a lot of like um, careful conversations that we have to have where we're just kind of like, no, come and join us, you know, like be a part of it. It's OK. You know, it's a space for you. But I think that it's it's definitely like one step at a time, you know. Um, I was going to mention kind of the same line um, that similarly, but also kind of different. So my mom is fully Jamaican and then my dad is just African-American um and we were talking right before I started recording about how um Bella was asking me just kind of around the same lines of just like if I have kind of felt like an outsider kind of um and I said for me not really because I don't really think about it on my day-to-day -day basis but then sometimes when I live at, we live in a very, very white town, like majority white by far. And so everyone's like, oh, I'm 50% Irish and 50% French or something. I just like, can't really, I know I'm 50% Jamaican, but I don't know what the other 50% is. I just know it's like African-American because we don't really have that history. 
Um, but kind of, I'm kind of jumping around, but when you said uh, most of the stigma comes from inside the community, I definitely um, 100% related to that because being raised in a com almost completely white town, all of my peers are majority white, if not all white, um, not all white, but like majority white. And um, from, I just kind of, just my lifestyle has just kind of been in the way that I just see my friends and I just the experiences around me has shaped how I act. And so the way that I speak, the, my interests and things like that. But I have found that when I go spend time with people who are people of color, I feel more of an outsider than when I'm just with my typical white colleagues because they're just my friends and they're just kind of who I've grown up with. Yet when I'm in kind of what you would like my identity, I feel kind of like an outsider then. Cause like Bella said, like, I'm not, I'm not white enough. I mean, I'm not white at all, but like my, <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> how I act is not white enough to completely like fit in. But at the same time, I'm very whitewashed to the point where I don't fit in with my people of color. Um, and so I just really related to how you mentioned that. And I liked how, cause I feel like a lot of times we think of, when we think of stigma, we think of it kind of from like outsider in and kind of yeah. impeding on who we are. When a lot of times it can be just as hurtful and just as damaging um, when it comes from your own people. If not, I would beg to differ, like if not more so because you're kind of like, this is who I'm supposed to be, we're supposed to be accepting, yet they're the people who are kind of like causing and that. I think, think that a lot of it, I don't know a lot about American, like, well, I mean, we know what we see on the news, right? So well, I don't want to- That's probably true. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> it's probably, we have kind of got, like, gotten accustomed to it. So it's probably like at face value for you guys, whereas we're all like, what? Like another school shooting? People not wearing masks? <laughs> another day in the park. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds so bad. Don't take that literally as me not caring for who we're supposed to. Be. I hear you. I hear you. And, and it, even though it's even though we laugh, right? Like sometimes we're just laughing off the pain, right? And I think that that like what you're saying. Look, I do have friends that grew up in what you can say like predominantly white neighborhoods, and like being a young and and this is out of like complete respect, like being a young black girl within Kenya, right? Like. It's just like, it, it, it probably was a struggle growing up for you. And I, I can only imagine like having those different conversations with other young women who have grown up probably similar to your experience. It is so, so hard. And it's, it's not a matter of like not feeling accepted. It's just like you might have never been exposed in the ways that you could. You're exposed to what you were exposed to. You know what I mean? You weren't able. Like, have you ever been to Jamaica? No, we were oh, planning no. a trip. No, you got, we're I planning say, a trip. I thought you had been at least once, but no. Yeah. Like, if you go, or even Colombia, like, if you go to Colombia, there's probably a lot of, like, there's probably a lot of people of color there, wouldn't oh, there? Oh, no, be? yeah, it's entirely, yeah. It's yeah, very like, mixed. Everyone is, like, yeah, everyone's, I, like, I haven't been in the sun in a while, but <laughs> <laughs> I was, how tan I was, and darker, it's very a mixed yeah. culture. Yeah, exactly, and even, like, if you were to experience Jamaican culture, like, once you're exposed to it, it's in you, it's in your blood, it's in your blood, it's just a matter of being exposed to it and being like, okay, this is me, like, this is who I am, this is my culture, like, the, I personally, especially Caribbean culture, like, I go to, like, the carnivals, I, I, you know, like, I don't know how much you know about, I don't know, I just feel like I never hear much about Connecticut, so I'm like, I just feel like, for me, it's off the grid for me, but, like, there's nothing like, to hear. Like, yeah. which is cool that you guys are doing this and exposing yourself to so many different things right but I think that like when you even think about like the Caribbean culture like for me if I don't have my culture I don't have anything right like that's who I am I love soca I love dance I love all these different types of music I love reggae music and if you guys ever want to hear it or you're not sure where to look like let me know I could always send you these things that are your culture you know we have so many like Jamaican friends that that the culture is so important so I can only imagine that that what you have been experiencing and I, and I would never say that it's like okay I'm not like you know I just don't feel accepted by them or whatever it's just something new right like and I, I experienced that when I go into more white spaces I'm like okay I don't know how I feel about this I don't know how to interact because everybody I know is a person of color I work in a space that works around like anti-racism so 
being in a space with a bunch of white people is honestly sometimes nerve wracking for me. It makes me nervous. It makes me scared of, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to act. I've never been exposed to these things. Right. So I think it's just a matter of like not assimilating, not letting go of your culture, being able to understand that, yes, you grew up in a white neighborhood, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that you've become a white person. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know this, like, I don't want to get too far into it because this could be a whole conversation. Yeah. Love to now, yeah. You guys. I, but I, I really love that perspective. And I think that's just like being exposed to your culture, like at any, at the end of the day, even if you didn't grow up with a group of black friends, that doesn't make you less black. You're still a black woman, you know? you're still going to experience those things or you're still, uh, a, a, you know, not a white woman, right? You still experience those barriers. So you can't erase that and be like, that's, you know, I don't I feel accepted. You still share something with that community that you're always going to share. You're always going to be a black woman. You're always going to be a brown woman. You're always going to be a woman of color. So I think that, you know, taking that first step and understanding your culture, just be like, hey, mom, like, you know, what's Jamaica like or dad like you know whatever you know what I mean so I think just being a part of your culture and just understanding that you're not less black or you're not less a woman of color like be exposed to your culture because it's the best thing you can do for yourself in terms of understanding who you are yeah yeah you're gonna feel like an imposter until you are exposed enough where you feel just comfortable you may still feel a little bit of a pushback but but, you know, it's just because it's new. And when something is new to you, you're always going to experience pushback, right? Um, even I experienced pushback when I was doing this Indo-Caribbean stuff because I'm like, I didn't really grow up in indo Like, I grew up in Indo-Caribbean culture, but not really. So, like, you know, my parents weren't cooking curry every day or my parents weren't playing Indian music every day. Like, they played rap. They played hip-hop. They played all these different things, right? So it was. it's just a matter of, like, me understanding that even though I didn't grow up with that stigmatization of what I'm supposed to be, it's still who I am. And no one could define that for me. I can define it for myself because there's probably a lot of black women or a lot of women of color who are living in white neighborhoods who are experiencing the same thing you guys are experiencing and still share the same story. So it's just a matter of like finding those women, connecting with those women or even connecting with another woman who lives in the city, a black woman of color. A, a, I think having mentors is key, right? Like, you should have a black mentor who's in a position of power, right? Like that should be something that you have so you can understand her experiences. It doesn't matter where you grew up. You're still, you could still be her. You're still going to experience that. You know, have you ever heard um, Jay-Z song? That song where he's just like, no matter how Wait. rich. Kenya literally was like, before we started, she's like, should I do a Jay-Z quote for today? Well. And I was like, no. <laughs> so that's why I, it's just so funny. To you know where he's so rich? Rich and word poor and word. I, I don't know. I'll see if I can find it. Basically, what he's talking about in the song is that no matter how rich he is, no matter how poor he is, no matter where he goes, no matter what he does for himself and the businessman and the man that he is, he's always going to be a black man at the end of the day. So he'll always get treated a certain way, but at the, he's going to make sure that he uses himself to keep progressing and doing what he needs to do. But anyway, yeah, sorry, I went on a rant there. So go ahead. <laughs> no, yeah, I just really love that perspective. Um, And it kind of segues perfectly into the next question. Um, So this conversation has already been super impactful on Bella and I. So have you had any experiences where women have kind of come up to you and just explained the impact that you've had on them and that your organization has had on them? Yeah, of course. And like, sometimes I I don't hype our team up enough as much as I feel like I should, because, um, but our team does it, but I feel like I never do. I'm just like, we still got to do more, but there's always women that come to us and DM us and be like, this is such a cool space. I've never seen anything like it. And I'm just so proud that we have it now, you know, like, thank you so much for what you're doing every, almost at least five times a week in our DM. Somebody, people come to us and they're like, thank you so much for what you're doing. Um, we're so happy to have a space like this. So we know that there is a need for it because when I first started, one of the pushbacks was just like, is there even women who I need to connect with? And then once we started to like grow and we started to see that, we started to see a lot of people reach out to us and be like, thank you so much because these these stories and these experiences resonate with me. That's incredible. Yeah, there's definitely something, there's um, a lot of value in just simply, no matter how near or far you are to it, just being able to be like, oh my gosh, I resonate with what they're going through or hey, that person looks like me. So there's a lot of value in that and what your organization is doing is simply that so I can definitely understand the large impact that you're having and I can't wait to 
see where you guys take it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I'm really enjoying this conversation, so I'm happy about that. Okay, we're at that point in the podcast where we get to talk about Food Incorporation. Um, and so um, for this, the kind of two main things that I kind of immediately thought of while planning was um, the blending of two cultures that you can see in, within food. Um, I obviously can't speak to Indo-Caribbean, but I know generally <laughs> when cultures come together in this kind of mixed format, um, you do see it in Colombia, um, you see it every day in the people and you see it in the food that has been blended over like decades uh, in the empanadas that have uh, native elements to it and uh, Spaniard elements and then modern day Colombia elements in it are so, just the, uh, yeah, you, you can see it in a lot of different foods or the arepa and stuff like that. So uh, can you talk about how you can see uh, your cultures uh, showing your food and how that blending looks. Yeah, I think that, I think food is one of the biggest things actually. Like when you first mentioned that at the beginning of the podcast, I was like, what am I going to say about this? But then when I started to think about it, I'm like, food is such a big aspect, right? Like food is what brings our community, our indo caribbean community together. Like, you know, there's things like, um, the different spices and the different, um, dishes that are usually almost the same, but just, I guess, as, when we look back at the indentureship, not to get into it too much, because um, like, as you guys can see, I can talk for hours, but um, when, when we don't, like when we look at the indentureship and people came over here, a lot of times people were trying to carry on their culture as much as they could, which is why they, we do have curries, India and Sri Lanka and all these places have their different curries and their different spices and this and that and how they season their food. But if you come to Toronto and you have the different dishes, you'll know automatically what is a Caribbean dish and what is like an a South Asian dish because the spices are so different, but yet the base, the basis of it is the exact same, if that makes sense. So like, it's the same idea, same concept, but it just tastes different because it's a fusion, right? Just like what you're talking about. It's a fusion of the South Asian and the Caribbean identity. And when people, even a funny story, like my grandma, when she came to Canada and she came to Toronto, um, there was this place called Kensington Market. And Kensington Market was the only, only place that you could get Caribbean spices. So even when you go back home, because now you've been through this diaspora of, from South Asia to um, the Caribbean, now to Toronto. So when you look at it in, in that perspective, you're like, you can taste all the differences. So when you go back, like, that's why I'm asking if you've been to Jamaica, because when you go there, there's like so much food. There's, the food is amazing. Like Jamaican food is amazing. But anyway, back to Indo-Caribbean food. Um, um, yeah, like, I think it's just really, really cool how you can see the different tastes and the foods and the fusions of like still keeping it um, connected to our culture, but at the same time, still evolving over time as we kind of develop through this diaspora. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah, for some cultures, you see it uh, more over a course of years, how it's been uh, blended. Yeah. For others, you see it as people move locations. And so I think that really speaks volume to how the blending of two cultures or more can show and appear in different places. Sometimes you have to really search for how that blended happened because it happened so long ago. Sometimes it's more obvious and you can see it and you can taste it almost immediately. Of course. Um, yeah. And on that, um, uh, like I said, everyone, every culture has a very distinct cuisine. Um, I personally love Colombian food. Love it more in Colombia, obviously, because it tastes yeah. better there because you have <laughs> access to the actual ingredients. But um, in America, uh, and I would imagine, um, or should I say Western society, I guess that would probably be a better term. Uh, uh, and I'm assuming Canada as well. Um, you see this kind of gentrification of cuisine in mainstream media. And what I mean by that is essentially, <laughs> like everything else, whitewashing of cuisines that are specific to your culture. For example, uh, this is a topic I can get real heated on real quick because um, it just annoys me so much. I appreciate it, but it annoys me. Like, I appreciate the culture being shared, but it just annoys me that how it's being shared, if that makes sense. It's appropriating, right? Yeah. So I hear you like Trader Joe's all their food is like I hate to say I'm gonna call them out right now uh for example in Trader Joe's you see a lot of food that uh it says inspired by Asian cuisine or Latin cuisine and it's like 
<laughs> you see in the suit, uh, if you go on Trader Joe's, you see all these things and it's like inspired by, and then it's like veganized or like dairy free, gluten free, which there's nothing wrong with making foods accessible, but it's to the point where it completely changes the dish, but still putting the pie to it, which irks me. Or like I was walking through our grocery store here, which is big Y for us. And I saw this little section because I, I can't have gluten. I'm allergic um, to the gluten-free section. And right before is like kind of a health section type thing or allergy specific. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I saw empanadas and uh, pupusas, which although pupusas are not specific to or aren't Colombian whatsoever. I grew up eating them in the because I lived in a suburb of Maryland. And uh, when I would go to Spanish uh, mass uh, after mass, uh, they would make us pupusas and stuff like that. So something I loved dearly. Uh, I go to look closer at them and there's no meat in it, like no cheese. It's like a vegan, and they're still using the term pupusa, a veganized pupusa of spinach and vegan cheese. And the other one was beans. And then a veganized empanada, which I hate to say it is completely opposite of the culture in Latin America. It's heavily meat, which uh, may be a problem for some, but you have a lot of uh, meat inspired in the food and you see it. And you don't use spinach and pupusas uh, traditionally, and you don't, you, don't, you don't leave those key ingredients out that make it what it is, but still use the term or, you know, I don't know. I'm going on a little bit of tangent, but do you guys see that in, in well, the well, okay. I feel like for me, like it might be a biased perspective in the sense that there's a lot of Caribbean restaurants where I live, like a lot, like there's tons. You're never short of a Caribbean restaurant. There's always one that you can go to and they're usually Caribbean owned. So over here, you don't see it as much, to be honest. And I would say that when we do see it, it usually comes from, like if we see it on the internet, like I remember seeing a lady, not a lady, I don't even know who wrote the article, but it was about somebody who created a flattened, a flattened croissant, flaky croissant or something, but it was just roti. It was, uh, yeah, it's just roti, that was it which is like a key, key, key Caribbean and Indian dish that are like, I guess like, it's not a dish, but it's just like a food that we have that we eat with everything. Like I literally had it for lunch, but, um, but yeah, like I've seen that online. So I would say I don't really see it in my community, but you definitely see it online where people are trying to like create these different like curry dishes or, or if you go to like restaurants, like moxies i don't know if they have that over there like moxies and this place and that place and all these different restaurants where they have like curried cuisine but it doesn't taste like it right like it's it's usually not as good at all um so those are the spaces that i would i would say that you see it the most but usually in my community specifically you don't see it as much yeah i might have sound a little aggressive in the past part but it's just because when you see it like you mentioned like someone online uh not saying it's not from uh, your specific culture, but not including that piece. I mean, we had a conversation about this relating of like not, I don't want to say not adding because that doesn't make sense, like sense, but um, not crediting. There we go. Cultures. We had a completely separate uh, conversation, but you see a lot online of people that are not crediting cultures and are saying that they're making these things um you know, not from scratch, but like implying that it's like this new concept. Like or, a, yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Which is frustrating. Yeah, yeah, you definitely see it. But I would say in my community, I don't see it as much, but definitely online you see it and it is, it is furiating. Like it, it does make you furious. It does and annoy you see everyone in the comment section too, that is part of whatever culture may be being appropriated within the video. Everyone's upset and we're, and it's not, no one's saying uh, don't make our cultures like food or what have you, but I think people just don't realize that you can't just essentially use every property of it, but take out what makes it the culture and then claim it as something completely different. You know? uh-huh. Yeah. 
I don't right. know if I've explained that well, but no, you definitely did. I, I 100%. And I think a lot of it has goes back to the idea of cultural appropriation and just like how much, how can you put this? Like how much we, we see it now and how much people are able to take advantage and, and how this happens to communities of color and how it is sort of, it's draining and it's stressful because we, we worked so hard to build up and then we're just broken down through things like appropriation or we're constantly fighting through things like appropriation. So definitely a hundred percent hear what you're saying. Um, do you have any just final words or advice for people who are wanting to learn more about their own culture, learn more about the Indo-Caribbean culture and just kind of along those lines? Yeah, I think that, um, like based, based on the work that you guys do and the work that um, like your podcast focuses on and where you're located, I would say more so maybe not Indo-Caribbean identity. Like if they, if they want to, if people want to explore and this Indo-Caribbean is listening to this, that's amazing. Check us out, www.roundgirldiary.com. But um, if not, like when I, when it comes to identity, it's just really take time to ask questions, ask questions about who you are, where you're come from where you come from and ask before, and I know this sounds so horrible, but sometimes our grandparents or our great grandparents that are still alive are the only ones who are connected to our culture. So ask the questions before you're not able to ask them anymore and your parents might not know. And then you don't know. And then it's, what are you passing along? Right? So I think um, when it comes to identity and when it comes to cultural identity, which is such a big part of who we are, um, ask questions, educate yourself and, always learn because your cultural identity is one of the biggest parts of who you are. So continue to learn about it and continue to understand that it, whether you grew up with it or not, it's who you are. So definitely understanding that side of you will fill that void. I feel, um, even for myself, like growing up as an Indo-Caribbean, not understanding that term and not knowing that term for a long time, kept a very, very big void in who I was. But once I started to explore it on my own and feel connected to it on my own without someone telling me that I needed to or that I shouldn't um, was when I really, really started to understand who I was. Yeah, that's great advice. I mean, um, if you're in the position uh, that you don't have uh, a living ancestor, unfortunately, that has that stronger tied, tie, not tied, talking about tie pods, um, tied to... Um, uh, your culture uh, look into resources but look make sure yes. you pay s- specific attention to who is providing those resources uh, yes. try to find it from like your that. own culture or your community don't look for it in places that are just giving you an like an outsider or perspective that's leaving out a lot of details or a lot of who you are look so if you're in that position just make sure again, you're looking for resources within your community and not provided to you from outside of your community. Uh-huh. Yes, that is very, very important. Look at where the resources are coming from. Um, and that goes directly into our quote. So um, I, shockingly, it's quite hard to find a quote about identity after, or let me change that, a very good quote about identity. Um, but as we were talking, Ashley mentioned a Jay-Z lyric, and I am personally not a Jay-Z fan, but I went back and read the quote that I initially looked, and it's actually very good, so it's by Jay-Z, um, and the quote is, identity is a prison you can never escape, but the way to redeem your past is not to run from it, but try to understand it and use it as a foundation to grow. Um, I, love, I love that. I think I'm going to use that as my favorite quote from now on. I really, I really liked it. I was like, okay, Jay-Z. Um, but I really liked it just because, um, I mean, everyone knows that like the way to truly solve something is to go back to the roots. But I think a lot of times when it comes to who we are or our identity or just something kind of more personal, um, I think we have a lot, a hard time doing that and looking backwards and working backwards because that can bring up a lot of unwanted feelings, negative feelings, but that's also kind of the only way that you can truly understand it. And so um, I think by going back and looking at kind of our history as to who we are and stuff and looking at the right right resources, um, you're able to just get a better understanding. And while some of it may be kind of hurtful, a lot of it can actually be more beautiful than you even expected and helps you just to truly understand 
more and connect in different ways to yourself that you didn't really know. Um, that's what I kind of took away from it. Yeah, I think so too. I think um, I love that he indicates that it's the foundation of who you are. And I think that's one thing that we really focus on with Brown Girl Diaries, understanding that if you don't understand this piece of yourself, if you don't understand your cultural roots, you don't understand where you came from, you don't understand the history of where you came from, your your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents, you'll never be able to carry on your legacy. You'll never be able to understand who you are. So I, I really love that a lot. Which is perfectly segued into a book we were talking earlier about, um, oh, generational trauma and I think identity and finding out who you are, you do have to identify that if you have any within your family to help you heal. I think it's a big part of your healing process. And we mentioned earlier that there are some books that we have as suggestions. So the two books that if you want to read more into generational trauma uh, in general um, are It Didn't Start With You, How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who You Are and How to End the Cycle by, by Mark Wallen, W-O-L-Y-N-N. I believe that's how I say it. And this is more of a journey, how, how he identified it and his journey through it and then how he helps others. And so he talks a little bit about others um, kind of process through that. So you want that kind of less science-based, but still influenced by science and talks about research. That's your route. Or the body keeps score, brain, mind, and body in the healing of trauma by Bessel van der <laughs> Klonk. Klonk. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I think it's is that two presumptuous. It's like German or something. Um, it seems to be written by a doctor which would explain why it's a bit more um, science-based uh, and more logical process and talks about uh, psychology and uh, physiology and stuff like that. Yeah, I just started the Body Keeps the Score yesterday and mm -hmm. it is more science-y than I anticipated, but it's actually very good and actually a very easy read. Um, so if you are interested, you should read it. I am a big fan and I just started. Um, Ashley, would you like to promote any of your social media, your website, your organization? Yeah, of course. Um, follow us on Instagram at the BG Diaries. That's T-H-E-B-G-D-I-A-R-I-E-S, Diaries. Oh my gosh, put myself on the spot there. Um, and our website is www.browngirldiary.com. Um, and our Facebook is the Brown Girl Diary. So super, super simple. If you follow us on Instagram, you can find everything. Um, but yeah, that's all our um, promo right now. But thank you guys so much for this. This was really amazing. And I'm really happy to be a part of this movement. Thank you. We really enjoyed talking to you. Um, this was a very enlightening, um, I love that word, <laughs> episode. <laughs> and yeah, can't wait to see what you guys do in the future. And we will stay connected for sure. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. As usual, you can find us at our website, uh, www.nourishmysoul.org, or you can search us up on Facebook, uh, Nourish My Soul. You can look us up on Instagram for Nourish My Soul. And you can look us up for our teen group from the ground up on Instagram without the O and from. Um, if you'd like to email us and talk to us a little bit that way, you can email alicia at nourishmysoul.org. Alicia is spelled A-L-I-C-I-A. And if you would like to listen to us, you can uh, listen to us on YouTube. Just search up Nourish My Soul. Spotify, Google Podcasts, Anchor, Breaker, Pocket Cast, and Radio Public. And if you search up on any of those platforms, be sure to search Radical Thursdays. Peace out, Girl Scouts. After a while, Crocodiles. Oh, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, and Non-Binary Scouts. Uh, have a lovely day. Bye. See you next week.